So welcome everybody to the Mid-Atlantic Logger Training Webinar Series. I guess you can't see that. Let me hide that other, other panel too, if I can. Hide video panel, hide floating meeting controls. Okay, there we go. All right, everybody, welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Logger Training Webinar Series. We're really glad to have you here. Um, there we go. Today's webinar is drones for loggers. We're going to be learning about the tools, technology, regulations, and steps to use drones effectively. But before that, a few housekeeping items. Um, I'm your host tonight. I'm Karen Snape. I'm with Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Sharp Logger Program. Um, so thank you for being here. Just to let you know, the session is being recorded. Uh, it will be made available uh, for continuing education credits on the West Virginia Learning website. Um, all participants are muted and your video is off and you cannot adjust those settings yourself. That's how we set up the webinar. Um, but if you have questions, you can use the question and answer icon, the chat icon or the raise hand icon. All of those should be at the bottom of your screen. You may have to scroll your mouse around or if you're on a tablet or phone, you might have to tap your screen to get those to come up. But um, if you use those to uh, post a question or a comment or uh, to ask permission to be unmuted and speak, then uh, you can do that with those. And we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation where we'll go over all of that. Um, so tonight you'll be earning one continuing education credit in whichever program you are a qualified logger in. So whether that's the Sharp uh, Virginia system where I work or that's Maryland, Delaware or Ohio or West Virginia. And um, within about a week of tonight's session, um, you should get a certificate in your email. And uh, each of us who manage the logger education programs will get that certificate or a roster as well. So um, we'll be able to um, award your credits without you having to forward us the certificate, but you probably wanna hold on to it just in case anything goes wrong um, or you need to you know, come back later and be like, oh no, I, I attended the drone one and here's my certificate. Um, so, and that's just the ones where you included your logger number when you registered. So if you forgot to include your logger number or you're um, a qualified logger in more than one state and only put one down, just let us know, um, get in touch with any of uh, the four of us that manage the, the, our programs and we will get you sorted out, um, either your person or, um, or one of the rest of us, so. This is the schedule for the rest of our webinars. So um, last month we had legislation and other issues affecting loggers from a national viewpoint. We had uh, the American Loggers Council and um, FRA here. So that is now available on the West Virginia Learning um, site if you wanna check it out there. Uh, drones for Loggers tonight, we're gonna talk about stress and dealing with stressors in the logging industry next month. Uh, in April, we're going to talk about current logging issues in uh, the various states. We're going to have kind of a round table of, uh, you know, logging organizations, forestry organizations, people that can speak to what's going on in each state. And each one will have about 15 minutes for uh, an hour total. On May 31st, we're going to have a business uh, webinar, business side of logging. And on June 28th, we're going to be doing invasive plants. So uh, a variety of topics there um, over the next um, four or five months. Now, that's what we have left to do. Um, does anybody have any questions about sort of the housekeeping items and the, um, uh, you know, stuff about the, the webinar series generally before we get started tonight? Um, and I cannot see the chat right now with my screen view. So um, Agnes, Ben, or Brad, uh, if you see any questions there, uh, if you could relay them to me uh, audially, I would uh, appreciate that. We'll deal with nothing, nothing yet. Okay. Well, if you um, come up with, uh, if anybody has a question again, we have those three ways for you to ask us questions. Um, so then um, we'll get started with tonight's topic. Tonight's speaker is Dr. John McGee. Um, he serves as the Geospatial Extension Specialist through the Virginia Tech Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. 
In addition to providing workshops and educational programs on small uncrewed aircraft, drones, he also serves on the leadership team of the NSF funded GeoTED UAS project, on the FAA supported Virginia Pilot Pathways program, and serves as the state coordinator for Virginia View. In his spare time, John enjoys hiking, sailing, and heading to remote areas of the globe. So uh, with that introduction, I will turn it over to John. Stop my screen share. Okay. Let's see. So I can't screen share. It says host is disabled participants. Ooh. Okay. Try it now. Sure. There we go. All right. Let's try this one. All right. Can you guys see anything? Yes. Yep. Right. We see your, your see your presentation. I will um, mute myself and let you go ahead and take the stage. Thank you, John. All right. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I always like I like talking about drones, and I especially like you know meeting a, a new group of stakeholders. So it's it's always fun to kind of get out and about. Um, but so let's just let's. And I forgot to ask. Um, how long do I have? I guess I should ask that like yesterday, but. Oh, that's okay. You have about um, so about an hour from when we started, which was eight minutes ago. So um, about fifty minutes, if you want them, forty-five minutes, Fair and enough. then we'll do some question and answer. Fair enough. Perfect. Right. So this is kind of where we're headed today. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna go over kind of an overview of drones. We'll talk a little bit about regulations, but that's a whole day or two, so we're not going there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some sensors and data because that's what this is really all about. Um, some skills and some duties associated with with working with drones, you know, forestry applications. Those are sprinkled all along the way, and then you know some educational opportunities and some resources. So when you hear the word drone, you know what do you think of? Um, so just kind of conjure up some images. Um, because there's actually no wrong answer. You know, basically, a drone is anything that is basically uncrewed. Um, you know, it could be a drone could be a sub, you know, a submersible. It could be a, a an uncrewed boat or an uncrewed terrestrial vehicle. But for this presentation, you know, I'm going to concentrate on the flying type, the aircraft. And you know, most of what we do here. I'd say 70%, maybe 60, 60, 70% of what we do here, we work with quadcopters, hexacopters. So that's kind of what I think of when I say drone, but we also have fixed wing aircraft. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But the take home message here is that a drone is just a vehicle, all right? And it's actually, you know, the vehicle is, is really not, not, not what we're into. I mean, it's great to kind of fly a drone, but it's what the vehicle carries that's the important part. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So, you know, I always like to kind of start these types of presentations with kind of a background. So, you know, let's go back in time about eight, eight nine years ago, I was like walking through one of those big box stores and, you know, they had some drones on the shelf and I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. It's got a little camera on it. Um, and it was pretty expensive. So I carefully set it down. And then the same week I was in Kroger going down the gadget aisle and they had these little toy drones there. And I was like, whoa, you know, that's kind of weird. And then, you know, the next week, believe it or not, I was at my gas station way out in Giles County and sitting there beside the ice cream cooler, they had these really even smaller drones. And I was like, whoa, what has happened here? It's like somebody flipped the light switch on and drones just came out of the, the woodwork. Um, so obviously, you know, the military has been working on this kind of stuff for a long time, but the commercialization of this technology basically has its origins right there in your back pocket. Um, because if you think about what's in a smartphone, you know, this technology is just supercharged the drone industry. It's uh, all those little gadgets within your smartphone, you know, the navigation software, stabilization, gimbals, cameras, batteries, you know, uh, data storage, antenna, you know, all of that it was miniaturized, improved, and not only that, but it all works really well together. 
So basically, you know, a, a drone is really not that much more than a smartphone with some propellers on it or, or wings attached or something. Because most of what you need in your smartphone is also what you'll find in your drone. So, you know, let's look at some, just some basic rules. And these are, these are what I, I kind of call the top eight. Um, so for people who intend to fly or operate a drone commercially, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to pass the FAA remote pilot certificate exam. And this is a 60 question test that you have to take at an approved uh, facility. Excuse me. Um, so in part of, part of this exam, you've got to learn quite a bit about drones actually. Um, for example, we can only operate drones in what's called class two airspace. Um, and you must be able to kind of see a drone at all times. We call that the visual line of sight. Um, we can't fly a drone above 400 feet. We can't fly a drone over moving cars. We can't fly drones over people or activities that are not involved with our project. And we've got to keep away from restricted airspace. And then the drone can't weigh over 55 pounds. And this is all because, you know, the United States has some, some of the most restrictive regulations probably in the world. And it's because we have the busiest airspace in the world. And so the, the FAA is moving incrementally and rightfully so to make, to continually, to make that uh, safe. So these two things in red, this is what gives, I think, foresters uh, probably more headaches than, than some of the other regulations. Because, you know, generally we're, we're flying a lot of times in class G airspace because we're, you know, usually in rural areas. Um, but, you know, the fact you've got to see the drone at all so times, keep it within your line of sight, and you can't fly it above 400 feet, that, that kind of adds a little bit of constraint to, to what foresters want to do. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that in more detail here in a little bit. Um, so, you know, one thing we did when we started providing education and training on drones is we wanted to figure out what, what, you know, drone professionals did, what kind of skills they were looking for. So we, uh, pulled together eight, eight or nine, I can't remember, uh, professionals and put them, locked them up in a room for a couple of days and hired a facilitator. We produced what's called a DACUM, which stands for defining a curriculum. And this DACUM, it's not like a curriculum itself. It's just what are the tasks and the duties associated with a particular industry. Um, and then you can base your curriculum off of, off of this chart. And I don't really expect you guys to be able to read this chart. Um, you can download it you know, on that link on the side, on the left-hand side over there. But what I do want to point out is, so all these little squares are different duties that a drone operations technician or a drone operator might do um, when, when they're working on a project. So there's, there's a lot of duties associated with this. And it could be, you know, flying, you know, flying your, your objectives, you know, loading data on the system. But the important part here is just one of these little boxes, and it's the one that's circled, is, you know, operate the drone or fly the drone. So this is what everybody thinks about when they think of you know, drone operations is flying. But it's actually just one small piece. And it's really, you know, I don't want to minimize it, but it's kind of the easier piece in the puzzle um, if you've done everything else correctly. And that everything else is usually, you know, planning your flight. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, <clears throat> you know, so when we look at those duties, when we look at the regulations, you know, you might think, hey, do I need a remote pilot certificate? Am I really a commercial pilot? And basically, if you're operating a drone, you know, for profit or for an exchange of services, then you are a commercial pilot. And, you know, obviously engineers or surveyors would fall into that category. But, you know, when you think of commercial, a lot of people don't realize, you know, it also, um, it, is, it also is, is, uh, is part of the duties for say a local government, state agency, a federal agency, um, you know, uh, university employees here, like here at Virginia Tech, if we're doing research, outreach, or instruction, you know, we have to have a uh, commercial pilot certificate or commercial remote pilot certificate. 
Um, and basically, you know, even if you're if you're using a drone that's been purchased by a um, a private sector company or your, or your university, it's it's a good idea to have a remote pilot certificate. Basically, this is your driver's license. And if you're, you know, if something does happen, which we hope that never happens, but if something were to happen, if your, your drone were to fly away and crash into a building or a car or person or something, you know, you want to make sure that you're you're not liable. And so this is like having your driver's license. So your insurance would probably they may come to your rescue a little easier if you have a remote pilot certificate in hand than if you don't. And so here at Virginia Tech, we have to have a remote pilot certificate if we're operating a drone. It's it's just there, there's no other way. <clears throat> so also theoretically, so an agricultural producer, so somebody who's using drones to increase their yields, they you know that's part of business. So they you know would need a remote pilot certificate as well. <clears throat> so what can we do with drones? So you know drones they carry payloads. And when we talk about payloads, we're really talking about different types of sensors. Um, and so, and, and, there, and there are different types of payloads. Um, and so, or sensors. So when we talk about these sensors, we need to kind of understand how sensors work and how energy works. And so I'm going to take you guys back um, to physics 101 here in a minute. So you'll just kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, and then we talk about, you know, kind of an, a range of payloads. So drones can capture still images, they can capture video images, and these video images can be, you know, mounted, you know, right there, right there on their, uh, on their joystick or their controller, or, you know, you can have goggles and you can kind of see things happening in real time while you're flying as well. Um, and then, you know, so we can have still images, video images, and those can be from different types of sensors. And, but we can also capture and generate digital surface models. Um, and that can be done, you know, basically just through a, a normal camera. You don't have to have, really have any fancy equipment to develop a digital surface model. You do have to have kind of fancy uh, image processing software on the back end, but, you know, you don't need an amazing system just for, you know, it's not going to be survey grade, but it'll be, you know, what I call kind of planning grade or reconnaissance level grade. <clears throat> so, you know, so as I mentioned, drones carry these payloads or these sensors. And so when we talk about these sensors, you know, these are all based, you know, it, it all goes back to kind of what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's what we're looking at here. So this is back to, you know, your high school physics class. So on the left side of the spectrum, we have shortwave radiation. And as we move to the right, this radiation, these wavelengths get longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. So the important take home message here is that what we can see, you know, visible light, uh, which are, are colors basically, that's only like a small sliver of this entire spectrum. So, and, and there, there's important data potentially, if we could see it, that's happening out here in this infrared area. So, you know, imagine if we could see an infrared, we could, we could learn more about, you know, trees and vegetation using a special sensor, if, if we could see it. And so that's what these drones enable us to do is they can enable us to collect data in some of these other wavelengths that we can't see and, and they can help. And then the software can visualize it for us. So I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> so this is an example of, you know, obviously the sun shining, all this energy is coming down through the atmosphere. Um, some of these wavelengths, these, these shorter wavelengths, they strike things up in the atmosphere. It could be dust particles or gas particles, you know, whatever. And they get, they get kind of reflected back into space. And that's, that's good because that you know, keeps the bad stuff away. But then some of it, obviously, some of this energy makes it through the atmosphere. And that's like the, the visible wavelengths, blue, green, and red, and some of this infrared stuff, and you know, other wavelengths. So once these make it through the atmosphere, they strike something, which could be a tree, and then they're either absorbed by that tree or they're reflected. And so our sensors are measuring you know, what's reflected. <clears throat> and this is really important. 
And the reason this is important is because, you know, healthy or vigorous vegetation reflects well, wavelengths differently from not so healthy vegetation. So, and that's especially true in, uh, in this near infrared band, or this near infrared wavelength. So, you know, obviously, you know, you'll have some absorption and scattering of the blue, green, and red wavelengths. Um, and with healthy vegetation, you know, you're gonna have a lot of reflectance from the near infrared, which is this big black arrow. And we're also gonna have, you know, some healthy reflectance from the green uh, wavelength. And that's why, basically why trees or leaves look green to us, is that's that reflected green energy coming to us. Whereas, you know, a stressed or dying leaf, you know, all that green wavelength is being absorbed. So it's not being reflected and that's not what we're seeing. So what I'm saying is that, you know, we can get uh, sensors that can see this near infrared wavelength. And so we can detect stressed vegetation and healthy vegetation much easier using that data. So this is an example of a sensor, uh, you know, a true color sensor, which, you know, some people call a camera. Um, that can collect information in the blue, green, and, and red waves, wavelengths. And, um, you know, obviously that just produces an image that, you know, looks kind of normal to us. It's, it's the way that we, we see the world naturally. And so this is an example of a true color image. And actually, you know, I'll get into this later, but. This is actually a lot of images that are captured by the drone and they've been stitched together so it becomes a map. And one of the advantages of, of a map, of a drone captured map, is that you, know, you can actually uh, conduct fairly accurate measurements with it. So that's, you know, it's hard to do with video. Um, but with a map, you know, we could point here and then move our cursor here and down here. And you know, we can measure area and perimeter and figure out some things about our, our terrain. <clears throat> That's true color. And this is again just a map. And you know, oops, let me go back real fast. So this is a grove of this is a small grove of trees. And we can see just based on the coloration of these trees, and you know, I don't know what the real resolution is of your monitor, but some of these trees look, you know, I can tell they're a little healthier than others, um, just based on you know the greenness. And so this is an example of, let's see if I can get this cranking. Yep. So this is obviously a true color video. And what we're looking at is, you know, in this tree, there is an eagle's nest. Um, and, but, but I guess I'm using this example because, you know, it's a forestry application. Um, but we can also kind of look at the trunks of these trees. And we can look at how much, uh, what's going on in the understory, um, et cetera. And you know, we're using, I'm using this example because historically people had to kind of climb up these trees or fly low in helicopters to see if there was any anybody at home in the eagle's nest. But with drones, we don't have to do that. So it's much, much safer. Um, all right, so what else can we do with drones? Well, so we can, you know, we can use a near-infrared sensor. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the sensor that detects vegetation vigor. So you know, think of that as this near infrared band right here. So we're moving, you know, we're moving from the visible, uh, moving to the right along this spectrum. So this is what, you know, this is what an image from a near infrared sensor might look like. And so areas that are fairly bright, these bright leaves would be reflecting lots of uh, vegetation figures. Um, so, and then we can, so we can add colors to that, right? So we don't have to just see this kind of black and white image. And what we often do is we assign colors to, you know, a, to the near infrared as well as maybe red and blue or red and green. And we can come up with these, what we call false color composites. Um, and so this is known, this, this is an example of a false color near infrared image. And so what we're looking at here is uh, 
areas with, with high vegetation bigger are shown, uh, they've got higher redness values. So again, I'm looking at this little tree grove here and some of these trees are redder than others. And so those trees likely have more vegetation bigger. You know, the chlorophyll is just working a little bit better. Um, the soil could be a little wetter there. You know, there could be more nitrogen, who knows? But and that's, and that's an important point because this is like a first filter. This tells you, you know, this could tell us where things are good and where things are bad, but we don't know why they're good or bad. So there's still a lot of field work involved. You know, this is where are the good and bad things happening. All right, so that's near infrared. So we're going to pop down to another sensor, thermal. So, you know, and again, where near infrared was over here on the spectrum, we're moving farther to the right. Oops, I'm a little bit too far away. Um, so this is a longer wavelength. And since it's a longer wavelength, that means that, you know, typically thermal imagery, since this wavelength is longer, it's not quite as compact or or the energy is a little bit lower. So typically in, in, <coughs> thermal um, imagery has a, a, a coarser spatial resolution. <clears throat> so this is, again, this image should look kind of familiar. We've got the same you know, group of trees. Um, and this is just showing us uh, heat values. So, you know, it looks like there's a river over here that's absorbing a lot of heat. So the white areas would be reflecting more heat. So there's, you know, there's some something going on here. Could be some dark rocks. You know, these are obviously rooftops. I'm not sure what's going on here. But so this would be a, a good way to perhaps look for uh, soil, mo soil moisture. And then here's a, and I'm not sure this video is going to work, but let's just see what happens. So this is a thermal video of some deer. And I'm just going to be patient because sometimes it takes it a few seconds. There we go. So here's the forest again. Um, and this is early morning. So you can tell this is, you know, the brighter the color, that the, the hotter it is, the warmer it is. So we can see, you know, there's probably exposed soil here, so exposed soil here. There are some deer running across the field. Um, and what we found with the thermal imagery, you know, as I mentioned, the, the resolution, the ground resolution is coarser because it's that longer wavelength. Um, but it, it just works, it doesn't work great in the summer, you know, because the air is already warm. So it's good to get out there and use it on a, on a cooler day. <clears throat> that is if you're looking for heat. All right, so, and then we're gonna take all this together and put it together. Um, so there are some sensors that can detect, you know, a lot of different types of data. So it can, they can detect visible uh, data or visible wavelengths, infrared and thermal. And so this would be an example of a sensor that could collect, you know, six different uh, layers of data from the electromagnetic spectrum. And you know that we've got a multispectral sensor that can do eleven or twelve, and then you know there's a hyperspectral sensor we've got that can do about two hundred. So I guess what I'm saying, we you can make this as complicated as you, as you want, but there's no need to go there. I'm just kind of let you know what the what the potential is and what the future holds, really. So some other data products. So we've talked a little bit about uh, you know making maps, and we've talked a little bit about videos. And then the other data product that's often pretty popular is you know, digital surface models. And so this is an example of a digital surface model of a forest. Um, and so this is basically, this was, you know, this was captured just using, a, you know, I wanna say a normal kind of mapping grade drone, a little thousand dollar drone. And it, used to, it does this using photogrammetric techniques. So you, you can use a true color sensor and, and it's based on overlapping the images together and getting, uh, getting uh, data from different perspectives. Um, so in this example, the higher trees are red, you know, a little bit lower orange, a little bit lower or yellowish, and then we're down to green. And then finally you get down to the, to the, the grasses and they're kind of this teal color. So uh, 
<clears throat> All right, so we've talked a little bit about image resolution with these data. Um, and this is an important topic, um, especially for foresters. So on the right, we've got, you know, uh, that's probably about a meter, a meter and a half image pixel resolution. And over here, you know, this is probably on the left, it's probably a centimeter pixel resolution. And so, you know, when you see these, you think, boy, the, the image on the left, that's what I want. Smaller is always better. And that's, you know, that may or may not be the case. And, and we're going to talk about why that may not be the case. So, you know, in this case, it probably is because we can see what's going on. But so image resolution, it's often a function of, of flight altitude, how high your aircraft is above the ground. And I don't know if you remember, but back there at the very beginning, we talked about regulations. And, you know, we cannot fly legally above 400 feet above the ground. That's, that's our ceiling, right? So, and that's because we're trying to stay out of other aircraft's airspace. And that, this is really, it's, 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 it's really important. <clears throat> so, you know, if we're flying at 200 feet, you know, we get a smaller image footprint. So we're capturing, you know, a smaller area, but we're getting, a, you know, a resolution of, of each little pixel within that photograph is, is, is also smaller. So that means it's going to be, you know, theoretically we'll have a sharper image. Um, at 400 feet, our footprint's larger of our photograph or our image on the ground, and our pixel size is going to be bigger. In this case, at 400 feet, you know, one and a half inches is, a, is kind of a typical resolution. Um, and, you know, so you might be thinking, well, I want to go with a 200 foot model because I want my pictures to be crystal clear. Well, there's, there, there are some pros and cons to that. And so this is just one, one kind of con. So, so let's look at this first little, this, this thing, the 100 foot above ground, above the ground. So if we were to plan a flight 100 feet above the ground, we'd end up with a pixel resolution of, you know, under a half an inch, which might sound great. Um, but this flight, you know, these little flight lines, I don't know if you can see those little green lines, but that's where our aircraft would be traveling. There's a lot of flight lines. So this flight would take 10 batteries and it would, you know, generate about 2,629 images and it would take, you know, 146 minutes. But that, that 146 minutes, you got to keep in mind, that's just the flying time. So that's not counting the time that the drone has to come down, land, you know, stick a new battery in, you know, screw around for a few minutes, send it back up, and then it's got to go back to its flight path again. So, you know, that, this is a easily a full day's project. And then if we go to the 200 foot above ground level, you know, we're looking at a seven tenths of an inch pixel. Um, it only take three batteries, 771 images and 38 minutes. And so then we move to the, you know, the ceiling 400 foot. We're looking at one and a half inches to take resolution. We can do this in one battery. You know, it'll take us 13 minutes and we're off to the next site. So, and, and also I will say, so you know, when we're capturing images, we're not just, we're, we're not just kind of teeing up one image after, or we are we're teeing them up one after another, but there has to be, especially with forestry applications, there has to be overlap between these images. So they have to, you know, we'll take an image and the next image is gonna overlap the first one by 75%. And the next one will overlap it by 75%, both front to back and side to side. Um, so we've just found 75% is kind of a, a good base for that. Otherwise, the maps don't <clears throat> come out great. So, you know, when we talk about drones and forestry, I'm first going to talk about drones and agriculture. You know, this is one of the fastest growing sectors for, for drone operations. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say the agricultural folks, they've got it kind of easy. And, and the reason they've got it kind of easy is, you know, again, we've got our drone flying at a 400 foot ceiling. And, you know, corn's not really that tall. It's, I don't know, eight feet, seven feet tall, nine feet maybe. Um, so that gives us, you know, basically 390 feet between our drone and the top of, of, 
of the corn or the crop or whatever, which is, you know, that's a pretty good distance. And using that, you know, that we can kind of have some liberty with our image resolution. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is obviously since our corn is so short, and this is one of those regulatory issues we've got to be concerned about, about you know, we can keep the drone within our line of sight at all times. You know, <clears throat> there's just nothing hiding. So, you know, this is the, so this is the challenge with, with forestry. So, you know, we've got higher targets, which are, you know, we call trees that we're trying to, to, to take images of, whether it be videos or, or, or cameras, you know, images. Um, so, you know, we've got a 400 foot altitude cap, as I mentioned. And so, you know, but if, a, if your tree is 100 feet tall, and I think poplars can get, you know, they get pretty tall. But anyway, if your tree is 100 foot tall and your drones are 400 feet, that gives you basically 300 feet of, of, of clearance. And, you know, that, that means you'll have kind of a, a, a lower pixel resolution. And also, you know, perhaps more importantly right now, forested areas, they impact the visual line of sight. So if you're standing, you know, if you're standing right here above the VT or even over here where it says Virginia Cooperative Extension and you're trying to look at your drone, you know, once it goes over that first or second row of trees, you might not be able to see it. Um, and so we, we've been known to, when, we're, when we've got a, a kind of a big project, we've been known to go out there with a bucket truck and to get ourselves up higher so that we can keep our drones within our line of sight. And, you know, that's the bad news for foresters. It's, it's, a, it's just a challenge. But, you know, the good news is, is as I've mentioned, is regulations are evolving. Um, and, you know, there's some, potentially um, some recourse for foresters coming um, with what's called remote ID. And this is uh, something that's being slowly implemented, I think, by next fall, every new drone is supposed to have uh, a new transmitter on it, so that it can be it can it can be kind of followed more or less while it's flying, um, and it can be ID'd in the air. And I'm not saying that the regulations will change next fall, but that remote ID is the first step, I think, for a, for more beyond line of line of sight operations. <clears throat> So here's an image of some trees at 400 feet. And, you know, this is, this is fine. And it's, you know, this is just using a little GoPro camera. You know, I think this is off of a Phantom. It could be off of a Mavic, I can't remember. But this is, again, just a little thousand dollar drone. And we can clearly see, you know, some of the trees are not looking too well. There's a couple of beds hanging around. Um, but again, this is as high as we can go. And this is, yeah. So this is the, an image of a forest at, I think it's a thousand feet above the ground. It might've been 1200. And, you know, for what we were doing at this location, this, you know, we wanted to go, we would even go higher. So at a thousand, 1200 feet, I think our resolution was about, seven or eight inches. Um, it might have been a little more, but that's still plenty. I mean, this is crisp imagery for what we were doing. And, you know, we can still see dead trees. There's a dead one over here. There's, you know, I can see a palm tree down here. You know, plenty of dead trees. We can kind of discern, you know, different tree types. I don't know what they are, but there's different variations of color in there. You know, here's a place where there, you know, it's, it looks like shrub. Um, and, and the reason we were able to go so high is, you know, we were operating in uh, another country's airspace and they didn't have the 400 foot ceiling. So, you know, we weren't just breaking the wall here. Um, so that's, that's kind of an overview of, of, uh, of some of the basics associated with imagery and, and, and pixels, because that's important. The pixels, the pixel size, the line of sight for forestry operations is, 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 is a big thing. Um, so, you know, when we talk about drone operating and drone, you know, there are, there's multiple steps, as, as I mentioned in that Bacon. Um, 
And I've kind of compiled all those little tasks and duties into three major steps. So there's flight planning. So you just don't run, grab your drone and run out the door and fly. It. Um, you know, I think this is the most important. And this would include, you know, what kind of aircraft do you need? Do you want a, a, a rotary aircraft or a fixed wing? Um, what kind of sensor do you need based on your objectives for the day? Um, what kind of weather considerations should I expect when I'm out there? You know, how many batteries should I have? Do I need to take a battery charger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And then the final thing I've got here is software, autonomous flights. So I'm gonna talk about this, but basically when we're mapping forests, we, we don't do that manually. It's all autonomous. And I'll show you what, what I mean by that in a minute. And then step two, you know, we've done the planning, we're gonna go out and we're gonna do the flight. So step one, again, if that's done correctly, step two is easy. And then step three, we conduct the flight, come back, and that's when it's time to you know, pull the little the data card out of the drone or download the data. And you know, that's where the magic happens. And it, it's magic whether you're working with video or whether you're working with still imagery and creating maps. Um, so basically for what we normally do when we're making maps, we stitch all these little JPEGs together, all these still images together, um, we come up with assessments, recommendations, you know, if we need to go back out into the field, we do so. Um, and as I mentioned, all these data points, except for the video, the, 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 the still images contain latitude and longitude coordinates. So we are able to navigate specifically out to, you know, the, to a, a flat wall location to verify what we saw in the image. So this is kind of what step one might look like. So we've got, you know, flight planning. So we use software to do this. And so what we'll do is we'll, you know, go to our software and, and we'll, you know, kind of outline the area we want to fly. Um, using the software, it's very user friendly. We specify our flight height, what type of sensor we're using or what type of drone we're using. Um, you know, this big yellow uh, circle going around our flight area, that's a virtual fence. So that kind of keeps our drone from, from going out there. It's like a little, you know, a Roomba fence or a dog fence or whatever. Um, and so then we just basically launch the, the drone. <coughs> and the, the beauty with this flight planning is that, you know, let's just say that the drone, you know, it follows these flight paths. It's like watching somebody mow the grass. So we're not operating in controls and it's capturing images and images and images. And let's say the drone gets to right here and it's like, oh, my battery's low. So when the battery gets low, it comes back down, it lands, you pop in a new battery, you launch it, it goes right back and starts where it left off. And then the plane flies, captures images, and then, you know, it gets a little farther and whoa, you know, the wind's picked up. So you bring it down, you, know, you land it, wait for the wind to die down, and then you can relaunch. And of course, it'll go back to the same spot where it's flying along. And it's getting over here, and all of a sudden you notice, hey, there's a helicopter coming into our area from the, you know, from the southeast down there, the southeast corner. So you can actually use your, uh, use your little, I call it the control tower, to get the drone to come over here and just kind of circle for a while or, or hover, and wait for the helicopter to get out of the area, and then you can say resume mission, and it resumes its mission. Um, <clears throat> So these things, uh, the software is really smart and these drones are, are really smart. So this is how, as I mentioned, if you do the, the flight planning correctly, you know, the flight operations are really easy. Um, so, you know, we'll launch and then we're just kind of sitting back and watching because we're not, we're not doing the controls, but we are watching because we have to keep it within our line of sight. Right? And then this is step three, the data analysis part. So our drone's flown, it's captured all these little still images. And for us, you know, I, I do more mapping than videoing. Um, you know, we have to stitch, we, don't, we stitch all these little images together using software. And it's, you know, that, that happens, you know, that's actually a fairly easy part. And you can do that on the cloud or you can do that on your desktop. There's free software uh, called Open Drone Map which you know, I highly recommend, it's open source. So it just takes these individual still JPEGs and converts them into 
you know, one two color image mosaic. And again, if we use different sensors, you know, it doesn't have to be true color. It could be something like this, which uh, this image on the right uses, you know, this is derived from uh, uh, near infrared and, and red, it's an index, which is plant stress. So some other products are, you know, this is a false color infrared image. So again, the brighter the red, the more vigorous the vegetation. So we can see down here, I don't know if you guys can see it, but down here on the southern part of this image, you know, some of these trees are looking bright, bright red. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm guessing, as so is this grassy area, and I'm guessing, you know, you could think it's over fertilization, but it could also be, I think this is a southern facing slope. So these are just probably greening up just a little earlier than, than the rest of the area. Um, this is an example of a elevation surface model. And you know, this could be contours, it could be anything that we just went with before. So, you know, one thing we, we did, um, and this was in Heritage Park, which is about 160 acres, is you know, we had a project over there to see if we could identify Bradford pears and also altamolids. We were looking at some invasive species. And so that, you know, obviously, if you time this right, the Bradford pears are going to pop out like a light bulb, you know, if you can do it while they're blooming, which we were fortunately able to do. And then the autumn olives, well, you know, we, after kind of looking around, basically everything down there was autumn olive, either that or black bear. But so they were just starting, the autumn olive was just starting to come out. Um, and we're going to try this again, uh, either next year or the year after, um, using a, a, a sensor with some more, some more data on it, some more, some more bands, and uh, see if we can pull out some of the autumn olive a little bit. So this is, um, so this has pine seedling, but it's not, this is a Christmas tree farm. So you know, this was a, a student that did everything right except the labeling. Um, so this just shows you, it was, they were looking at, at uh, survival rates of seedlings. And you know, obviously they, this is kind of a, a pullback model, but this is, so this is not a video. That was actually an image mosaic. So we took digital images, stitched them together, and then we put that over a surface model and did a fly through. And now we've classified everything. So you know, obviously the, the trees are green and the grass is yellow. And you know, we could use artificial intelligence or, or another algorithm to do a, you know, a stand count and count the trees. So we wouldn't have to kind of do it by hand. <clears throat> So here's a prescribed burn. Let's see what I'm doing. All right. So this is pre burn. And I want you to take a look like over here, you know, up in the upper left corner. And then along these trees, this is where the burn is going to happen. All right. So let's just see what, what goes on here. And this was out, I think, in Craig County. So this was the burn. 24 hours later, I'm going to pause real fast. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this on your screens, but, and I'm, I'm up in the upper left hand corner here, but there is some pink kind of poking through this burn. So, you know, this burn may not have been 100% effective. They were trying to get some kind of undesirable vegetation. So, yeah, we may have to go back with a follow up. <clears throat> And then, so here's another post burn. This one's two weeks. And yeah, clearly, you know, this is still looking pretty vigorous. Um, and everything else that was burned was, looks like it was burned, you know, properly. And so, and obviously, so you think about that. So we could also go to this image if we had a thermal sensor and you know, perhaps fly the thermal sensor above this area, you know, just a few hours after the burn and make sure there weren't any hot spots left. So that would be an example of using a different sensor. So this is using right now, we're kind of we're using infrared. All right, so this is 
mapping the wetlands, but I included a little video here because um, we do take off and look at what's behind the wetlands. So this is kind of a reconnaissance. And I bring this up because I, I had a, a tree guy come to my house one time and he brought a drone and I was like, what are you doing with that? And he was like, well, you know, I like to send the drone up the tree before I climb up there just to make sure there's not like a hornet's nest or something. And I was like, ooh, that's smart. All right, so this is again, uh, let's see if I can get this thing printed. So this is again, this is the rainforest area from Panama. And what we are looking for, let's see if this will keep moving. There we go. What we were looking for was to see if uh, people were, you know, poaching wood on a large scale or if they were encroaching onto this conservation uh, land, which is happening. So there's a farmer here, he owns a track. But nobody's supposed to be cutting down or, or uh, pasture, you know, having the animals out the pasture over here, which is clearly happening. And these are in some really remote areas. So, so we flew about this conservation area. That was about 1,300 acres, I think. And, and we had to, you know, that's something you'd want to do with a fixed wing aircraft, not with a, a quadcopter. All right, so. I'm going to quickly go through. So I do have a lot of resources on my website, virginiaview.net. Um, so there's a drones tab, which has some drone resources on, obviously, software and apps. So this has a lot of uh, software and you know little apps associated with drones. And this will be at the bottom of the page. And then under educational resources, you know I, that's where I post workshops that we're hosting, um, et cetera. And I do have a couple of up, upcoming workshops. I'm getting ready to schedule another one for the summer. So stay tuned. Um, that's for teachers. Sorry, teachers. Oh, yeah. So I put a lot of uh, video tutorials up on my YouTube channel. Um, and again, you can access all this from that virginiaview.net website. Um, and these have been highly, extremely popular, as have some of the manual flight exercises. These are more for educators, but if you're buying a new drone, you know, this is a great place to start. Start simple. All right, so these are just some general trends. So, you know, drones, they're, they're getting smaller, they're getting smarter, they're getting cheaper, but they're also getting more expensive because they're getting more complex and the sensors are getting more complex. Um, they're obviously gaining acceptance. You know, it wasn't that long ago if you said the word drone, people would duck. And that's that doesn't happen so much anymore. Um, they're easier and easier to use. Uh, they're more intuitive than they were eight or nine years ago by far. And, and basically, so now we're collecting data with drones, but we're moving from the data collector uh, realm to kind of the service provider where, you know, we have drones now that, that can do some spraying, you know, package delivery we've been reading about, et cetera. And so these are just, this is just some tips from the field. And, you know, safety is the key here because, you know, if you're not safe, you're going to get, you could get yourself hurt, you could get somebody else hurt, and or, and, or you could get in trouble on top of all that stuff. Um, you know, these are really wonderful tools for collecting pictures or images, you know, or data, however you want to call it. But, you know, before you head out there to do all this, you got to think, if I collect this, how am I going to use it? And sometimes you don't know until you see the data. And then you're like, whoa, I can use this to do that. Um, but I would, I'd start simple and start small. Don't go out and, and for heaven's sakes, do not go out and fly, you know, 160 acre track of land on your first try or even your first 10 tries. Start at, 20 or 30 acres um, or, or small. Um, you know, be real, re realistic. Every single flight and every single operation is different. You know, you're going to learn something new every day. Um, you know, to listen to what the needs of your clients are and make sure that your, your application, your drone application is fitting the needs of, of your clientele. And, you know, drones aren't for everybody. And I'm not certainly, I'm not trying to push them. Because you know, there are times I wish I didn't have to use them myself. Um, so yeah, I think we're ready for some question and answers. Hopefully, answers. We'll see. You guys got any?
Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, I'm monitoring the chat here. Um, I just wanted to, before I get into the questions, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I know this was a new audience for you, and I really appreciate um, the work you put into doing this for us. And you do have a question already. So this question is from Laurel. She wants to know, how would one acquire these different sensors for the drone, or are they a part of working up the data after flying? So how would you, okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, and I'll, this is how the drone industry has kind of started. So unfortunately, uh, most of the drones that, especially the lower end drones, which I, I you know, is a thousand dollars or somewhere around there or less. Um, most of those, when you buy the drone, it's got the sensor kind of attached to it. And I don't, I shouldn't say kind of, it is attached to it. So if you buy, a drone with a true color sensor, you're kind of stuck with a true color sensor. Um, I mean, theoretically, an engineer, somebody could take that off and put a different sensor on. But for the average person like me, um, if I want to then go get a thermal sensor, I almost have to go buy a different drone. Um, so that's why it's really important to think about your needs before you make jump in and make the purchase. You know, these a lot of these on these entry level drones, the the sensors aren't swappable. You can't just move them on and off. And even the bigger, more expensive drones where they are swappable, you know, it, it takes, it's not something that happens in five minutes. It's an hour or so of turning screws and attaching wires. So there are drones that have multiple sensors, true color and near infrared or true color and thermal, um, but you just need to know what you're going to do before you buy the drone. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was interesting for me. I didn't know that. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, if you, you might have to scroll your mouse around or tap on your screen if it's a touch screen to get that to come up. But you'll see a little looks like a cartoon talking bubble, uh, which is chat, or you can use the Q&A, which is just two of those little cartoon talking bubbles. Or if you'd rather vocalize your question, there's a button down there that looks like a hand and that will let you raise your hand. We will see that you want to speak and be able to turn on your microphone for you. So I don't see any raised hands. I have a question, John, for you. If uh, I can jump in while we wait for other questions. Um, can you briefly go over how long, so if I go out and buy a, a $100 or a, a $600 or $800 drone, basic one that has a camera with true color sensors on it, um, can you tell me briefly how long it's gonna take me to feel comfortable flying that around? Um, and maybe um, should I start at like a park um, where I got a big clear field or should I jump right over a lake or something like that? Or uh, yeah. can you give us some hints about how long that's gonna take me to get proficient enough that I can take off and land? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so what I often tell people is to, you know, buy, if you're gonna jump in and buy this $800 drone, do that. But at the same time, go buy the $30 drone. And practice with the thirty dollar drone, and um, and that way when you when you crash it or if you crash it, and it'll probably be more win. Um, you won't feel that that loss of of of, of the eight hundred dollar drone. Um, and so <clears throat> there are some basic exercises that we suggest people start with, um, and those are I've got a manual that kind of walks you through those. But it's just simple things like flying a box. You know, a horizontal box, a vertical box, a figure eight, a, a vertical figure eight, um, and um, you know that 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 teaches you. That kind of gives you some muscle memory of what the controller does. Um, and then once you kind of got, and, that, and the other great thing about that is the drone's never really far from it. It's just you know it's ten feet that way, but it might be going up and down. Um, so that if you do panic, you can just let it down right in front of you. And I, I would definitely go to a large field, a baseball field, a football field, where there aren't any people, nobody's still in a Frisbee, there aren't any cars or moving traffic nearby. Um, you know, go where nobody will see you because you, you know, the last thing you want is people coming up and asking you questions while you're doing this because then you get all jittery. So, um, so start simple. I would just start simple. Um, and once you've got the manual controls down, then you can go move to the next step, which is the automated 
flight plan. And that's really, the flight planning is really easier because you're not, you know, all you're doing is pushing the launch button and watching it fly, but you do need to know how to work it manually just in case something goes wrong because it in, in inevitably might. And that way you can bring it back home again. Great, Thank, thanks, John. Um, and Agnes has put a couple of questions in the chat for us. Um, she wants to know how much studying is involved in getting your uh, license or a permit, um, and how hard the test was, and what kind of insurance you should have uh, to do this. So yeah, that's a good question. So the test. Let's see. The first question was the test. So, um, so there is there's some test prep books out there that I highly recommend. Um, it's called the, and you can get these on Amazon, but it's, this isn't something you just walk in cold turkey and you take the test. Um, you need a good three days to study for it, or you can go to a, you know, a one or a two day workshop probably and have people help you kind of walk you through it because it's, you know, you're learning a lot about, a lot of us, this is learning about understanding the navigational charts, the, aer the aeronautical charts. And, you know, I'm a geographer. And for me, learning those charts was a, it was totally new. So it's not your typical map. So I'd say you need two or three days to learn the material. Um, and you do have to take the test at an approved testing facility. So you have to make a reservation. It costs $150 um, to take the test. Actually, they may have increased it to 175. Um, and then you have to renew your test every, or renew your certificate every two years. Uh, the good news is the renewal you can do from your home online and it's free. So you got to kind of jump over that first hurdle. Let's see, I can't remember if there was another part to that question or not. <laughs> That's a great answer, John. Thank you. Um, she also asked about insurance. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So typically, you know, if you're operating a drone, you know, with under your employer, Typically, your employer's insurance would cover you. Um, if you are your own employer, obviously, then you probably need to get insurance or you need to talk to your existing policy, your existing insurance company to see if, if you know, what is covered, you know, in terms of liability, um, you know, and also there are policies that will take care of your drone if you, if you wreck it. And obviously, you're, you know, you pay a little higher premium for that. But, uh, so yeah, that's just something you have to check on on a case-by-case basis. There are companies that will give you insurance for a day. So if you know you're going to go fly, you know, somewhere tomorrow, you can get insurance for a day. And I forget what the name of, you know, some of these companies are, but there's there's quite a few of them. And I, to be honest, I don't have any experience with them, so I can't say whether they're, they're really good or not. Well, thank you. And that, that kind of makes sense to me because it's kind of like with your car. You have insurance on your car for if your car gets damaged, but more important is insurance on your car in case you hurt somebody with your car. Exactly. And I think you can even get a day's insurance for a car too if you say are selling it and need to take it, you know, uh, to the point of sale or something like that. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but it is something that I'm not sure I would have thought of if Agnes hadn't brought it up. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions here. Uh, we'll get... Question for you, Karen. Um, Karen. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so some of the, the loggers uh, in West Virginia here are seeing drones being used by our state regulators. So the state division of forestry is flying some of their jobs, um, looking to see if they've reclaimed the site correctly, if they've done things that they said they were going to um, in order to help save uh, some time. They have a, a labor issue with not having enough foresters to cover everything. Um, so, so they're do, using that as a tool for, for regulation. Um, but I think there's also some opportunities for bloggers to fly the property themselves, record what they've done, um, and have a record, basically, that shows that, hey, this is what I did when I left the site. This was the condition of that site. And uh, now I have a video proof of, of all 100 acres or all 50 acres or whatever it is. Um, you can see the ground on the skid trails. You can potentially see where things were reclaimed. Um, so I think there's some really cool opportunities uh, to do some of that type of work. And especially with yeah, the flight planning, 
um, and that automated flight type system. So if you might talk a little bit about that, and then the other thing that I would like you maybe to talk about is how we might be able to use it for reconnaissance, um, for planning logging operations. So if we start with a, a forested area, um, what are some of the sensors that you would recommend or some of the flight techniques or data collection um, things that we should do in order to better be able to figure out where we should put a landing or where we should put a skid road? Right, so two so big questions, questions. sorry. Yeah. No, no, these are, these are really good questions. So I'll take a stab at number one and then stab at number two. So, and I think what you've suggested is, is, is a great idea. Um, the, the, the great thing with these flight plans too, is once you develop a flight plan, you know, over a track, um, you know, that means that the next, you know, you, you can save that flight plan. So you can come back in a year and just basically put your drone on the ground, push the launch button, and it'll fly exactly the same flight that it flew last year or last month or whatever. Um, so these flight plans, you know, they don't have to just be a one-time thing. You can save them. And, you know, that's, that's what the farmers do. They'll fly their fields once every two weeks. And that way they're able to, to identify, you know, where some of these hot spots are. It could be a pest or a disease or whatever, but they can catch it early because they're constantly monitoring. Um, so that's the beauty of a flight plan. It's, it's, it's not only automated, but it's saved so you can use it again and again and again. And then let's see, your second question was, so how can we use these tools um, to support operations and planning? Was that kind of what it yeah, was? Yeah, so recon, uh, initial recon, and then kind of the harvest planning that we do to, to locate uh, places that we want to be or places we want to completely avoid. <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, <clears throat> a, these things, so we can use drones to, to map to get a better map of you know where the water is like, and the streams, <clears throat> so you can plan for your roads better, your your tracks, or you know my full disclosure, I'm not a forester, so you know I'm going to call these things things that they're not supposed to be called, but uh, or areas where you're you know pulling the logs and chopping them up or putting them on the trucks. Um, so yeah, you could you could do all that based on uh, terrain. Uh, based on, you know, perhaps thinning what might need to be thinned and what, what's already been thinned, that would probably be easily seen from above. You know, we've, we've definitely had some success um, in the early stages of forestry using drones for seedling survival, looking at that. Um, and, uh, you, know, you guys, my problem is I don't really know what you guys do, so I can't say how you could use drones to do it. <laughs> So, so yeah, I think there's some, some good opportunities there to, to especially once we have topography um, and through some of those sensors, um, that's one of the key kind of data points that we use for figuring out where to, where to put landings, where to put roads um, and things like that. And then just using the, the basic color imagery uh, I think there's some really good opportunities, yeah, to, to notice where stocking might be a little heavier and we might need to spend a little more time in that area um, to harvest the number of trees that we might have to do in that area versus lesser stocked areas. Um, and those can all be, that data can be collected very, very quickly and uh, it wouldn't even require potentially uh, any post-processing or anything like that data. You can, if you can grab some of that data from just the, the imagery um, that you've collected, then that, that's really easy and, and quick and, and simple. And I, I think it would be possible to, you could use thermal probably to look for moist so or inundated soils, which would be places you may want to stay out of, but I don't know. Um, so one other thing that uh, I wanted to ask about is um, I know some uh, sawmills are utilizing um, drones and, and uh, technologies there for collecting data about their residue piles or their log decks, um, trying to estimate volumes uh, of material that they have um, and understanding better uh, how much supply they have for the winter or how much they have to get rid of and sell to somebody so they can. Uh, um, yeah, that's, and that's a great point. I actually had a, a colleague in Vermont who used, uh, he used ground-based LIDAR to do a volumetric 
estimation for, and I think it was for a, a big chip pile. And then he used a drone and the drone took about, you know, a 10th of the time and was, you know, within 5% uh, correct. So, it, you know, it's a huge time savings, huge. The, the final uh, kind of one that I'm familiar with that loggers are using is uh, out west, they're starting to use, um, like you were saying, for more of the service activity, rather than using the sensors, they're actually using larger drones to haul cables out to far ends of the, uh, of the logging job. So to help them set up the rig, of course, they're using very, very thin cables and ropes to get out there because of the weight, um, but then they can use those in order to pull the heavier cables out there. Um, which are tasks that used to take uh, hours and hours and a lot of strenuous labor uh, walking up and down huge mountains <laughs> carrying all this uh, material. So, um, so drones have been really, really helpful in some of those cases, but the, um, when we're talking about those, they become quite large and, and we're not talking about the, the, the $45 one you can get at the gas station. <laughs> so. Interesting, very interesting. That's uh, been a great conversation to listen to. Uh, we had a comment in the chat, um, not really a question, but Anthony says that he found a drone that has a return to home function and that that gives him great peace of mind that uh, if anything goes wrong, he can push that button and the drone will come back. <laughs> so. Yeah, and this, that's almost become standard on, on most drones today. Um, I, I do have a friend who pushed the come to home button or whatever. And unfortunately, his came to home, but it ran straight into a tree on the way. So there are there are some things you you know there are some parameters you need to set to make sure things like that doesn't don't happen. But, uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do we have any any uh, more questions? Um, I haven't seen anything. Um, again, uh, John, we really appreciate your time both uh, tonight, working late, and uh, you know the time you put into the presentation and um, thinking about our audience and um, and giving them this good information. So, um, just want to thank you. Um, Agnes also has written thank you in the chat, and you know, Ben and Brad uh, appreciate this, and so do our um, loggers. We got a thank you, very interesting from Kenner. Um, so uh, with that, um, I think that we'll call it a night um, since we're not getting any more questions. So really appreciate it. Um, appreciate all of you guys being here, all of you attendees, and hope you can join us next month or uh, one of those upcoming um, uh, programs that we have scheduled. So I will click end now. Yeah, you all should be getting a certificate within about a week, and that information will be sent to your logger program coordinator. Have a good well, night. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.